title of this presentation is China, Modern China, China After Mao. And uh, I'm focusing on the role of a guy named Harry B. Harry B. I'll tell you who he really is. And this single, singular contribution to make China the great country it is today. He's not even Chinese. He's not even from China. He's from Singapore. And all the things that he did to, 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 to train all the Ch Chinese presidents from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping made such a huge difference. Uh, just a little bit of introduction. This is a, we're having, I'm running a series of lectures to raise some funds for our veteran success center which is across, across the way there. They're the only job training center that's free to all our veterans, open every day. So we don't need any veterans or their spouses who need a job. We have thousands of jobs. Federal, state, city, BART's hiring, PG hiring. If you're, if you're qualified, we'll send you, we'll shoehorn you into that opportunity. So I mean, anybody, any veteran or their spouse needs a job, one to five, Monday through Friday, Veteran Success Center on the outside of the building. And because this, is, this building was built by the American Legion after World War I, we get to use this building, but to use it, we have to make sure we do something for veterans. And that's why we're certainly going to be successful. Otherwise, we would pay rent to do this. You're, you're being here today. We, we, success Center does not have to pay for uses. So it's for a good service, for a good reason. The other organization that's sponsoring this is Chinese American Heroes. That's an organization I started 15 years ago. And the purpose of that organization is to document the contributions the Chinese Americans have done for the nation. And among four and a half million Chinese Americans, only 250 have been awarded and recognized in the Chinese American Heroes. We have a website called Chinese American, Chinese American Heroes org. Visit it sometime, it's free. And uh, our mission has changed. We start out documenting the contributions of Chinese Americans then we expanded just recently to have community heroes, not just national heroes. And then the third step was to do young heroes. We are now going to high schools to find people who are doing particularly well in, in academics and offering them $1,000 scholarships. We just started this, this year. So uh, we are a nonprofit in uh, 501c3, so that's what we're doing now. Now, the, the next big mission that we have that I did decided we would do, we would promote peaceful and constructive relations between the United States and China. Nothing more important than that our two countries to grow up together and cooperate. If we can't do that, then everything's lost. So that's been our latest mission. And it fits nicely with the American, American Legion. You people don't always realize that in the American Legion, we have our preamble. And we state, we state this long preamble. This, this is a preamble written by a, a committee. It's the longest preamble. Nobody, very few people memorize something, but some people have. But the seventh, the, you know, the seventh declaration, we promote peace and goodwill on earth. And so that fits with our, what we're doing as, as heroes, is that we're trying to promote peace and goodwill between the United States and China. The two most important countries in this century, and if we can avoid a war and cooperate, a lot of things can get done. That's why we're doing that. Uh, we talked about Harry Lee. The question is, who was Harry Lee? Harry Lee is the name of the gentleman on the right. If he resembles that guy, it's the same person. Harry Lee was born in Indonesia in 1927. He lived through the invasion of the Japanese Imperial Army. He survived, and he learned from the Imperial Army that if you have strong, uh, the government has strong control, you can have peace and, and uh, peacefulness and order and stability. We learned that from that. He did not like the cruelty of the Japanese Imperial Army, but he said that when you have government strong controls, you can you do have stability and you can develop the country properly. The other thing, then after the war, he met this beautiful woman whom he married, who was, turned out to be his wife. People have suggested he married her because she was smarter than him. In all his, all his college classes, she always beat him in English and economics. So he said, I'm going to marry this woman. And he did. They both went to Cambridge, got
got their law degrees. While they were there after World War II, Lee was very, very shrewd. He said, going back to Singapore, I gotta make sure I learn all these things from the West so that when I, as Prime Minister, I can do Singapore great. So he studied the books, the textbooks in England. And he studied how, how the infrastructure was all well managed. And so when he went back to Singapore, in the early 50s, he put everything to work. Now, you have to know that 19, when uh, Singapore was established in 1965, they just been kicked out of Malaysia. They tried to try a merger because when Lee was the prime minister in the 50s, he recognized that Singapore had nothing. They, don't, they didn't have dams to catch water. So when, he, when they became a free country, 1965 independent country, they did not even have fresh water to drink. Now, if you don't have fresh water to drink, you're not going to get very far. So the first thing he did was negotiate with Malaysia, which is their neighbor, pipelines to have water. And his wife recommended in your, in your agreement with them, let them know that they, they cut off the water, they're at war. We're at war. Because without water, what can you do? Today, Singapore is a garden because they made sure they've got water, they've got desalinization plants. They even, when, uh, shortly after the, the government was established, there's a campaign for everybody's citizen who required us to plant a tree. And you wouldn't believe today, you see, you see, you see the pictures. Singapore is like a garden, an entire place, even though the building's all over the place. Because the plan was to make this place green, and they did. Bringing back to, uh, going back to the return, the other thing you learned from England is that all the great books, all the scientific books, all the journals, all, everything is in English. Even though this country had three major groups, Chinese, Malaysians, and Indians, and they fought with each other for, for many years in Southeast Asia. Even today, there's a lot of angry anger about between the Chinese and, and other people. But he knew that, and so he made sure that when he went back to Singapore, everybody would learn English. Nobody would like it, but that was best for the country. He recognized by doing that, people who didn't have access to textbooks, scientific journals, and they've already learned it, that's how he's going to make Singapore great. So everybody complained about it, but that's what he did. He set up a, a country based on meritocracy. Everybody is treated equally. Everybody had housing, public housing. Today, 80% of the population lives in public housing. Their public housing is not a shack. Everybody gets 2,100 square feet, two good-sized bedrooms, and a grand room. If you're rich, you have gold doorknobs. If you're a normal person, you've got aluminum doorknobs. But it's very, very fair. Everybody very, very fairly. People, do they have homeless in Singapore? Well, once you know, identify the homeless, you go to the government agency, they check you out, make sure you're not, you don't have anything contaminated. They give you an aptitude test. You, 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 can, you think all you can do is cook, they send you to cooking school. If you, you have some good math skills, they send you to technical school or to college. You have six months where the government find, gives you housing, clothing, and a salary of roughly two thirds of what you would make after you graduate. You're required to open a bank account start managing your money so that when your six months is up, you're not going to start off with nothing in your pocket. And if you need a little more training, in some cases there will be more training. But once you're done, Singapore says, we've helped you, sir, ma'am. It's up to you. If you don't take advantage of this, you're a fool. And so there are no homeless people in, in Singapore now. There are a few beggars, but the, the whole, everybody looks down on them, so there's no status to it. And of course, we want her to serve our Kenny. Well, leave on you. Recognize that uh, it's all right to have tough punishments as long as you're fair, and everybody knows ahead of time. No drugs in the country. Drugs. Caught for any major crime, get caned. No recidivism. Nobody's ever been caned twice in Singapore. Once you've had it once, that's the last time. Every whole world knows you are. So that's the thing to be avoided too. So Singapore has solved all those problems. Lee was also a very brilliant man. He's very practical. He said that no country can be great if you don't if the top 10%, the smartest people, the most ambitious people, are not given the opportunity to draw the country up. 
So it's set up so that he made sure that the top 10% of the people always had this You got the opportunity to go get schooling. It was not always free, but they always make sure you got schooling because this Singapore, in 1965, the average income was $500 a year. Because of the successful programming and education, their average income now is $90,000 a year. That's a lot of money for 9 million people. $90,000 a year. And again, I want to talk about his wife. He married her because she was a brilliant woman. She reminded him when he became prime minister as a young man, if you want this country to be great, make sure you do not omit women. They got 50% of your brains. Make sure you allow them to contribute to your country. And so what do you do? Well, you don't want to get about politics, that's dirty stuff. So let's give them a status, give them a job, give them that. let's make them teachers. Let them run the education system. So when the women took over, they rewrote all the books. And today, when there's an international com competition, Singapore comes out. Last year, China came out number one. They, when you got 1.6 billion people and you pick the very best, it's hard, hard to beat them. But the Sings with a small little a dot, they really well. I think I'm jumping ahead of my slides, but that's okay. But that was, uh, that was Mrs. Lee's major contribution is to make sure you give women jobs. And so they were the first country in Asia to adapt to the internet. And now they're considered the most, the smartest country in the world. They have roughly five million people. And uh, like I said, there's no homeless. Everybody's got a job. Best eating places in the world are Singapore. There's, there's the dot. This is a globe right there. Singapore, they have to, they have to magnify it so you see the dot. The dot is 220 square miles in 1965, but now 270 miles. They've brought in sand and uh, enlarged on it. They plan to add another, add another 50 miles, 50 square miles soon. All the. Uh, Sand and rocks. So the island now is 270 square miles. Now, what did Prime Minister Lee do to earn international recognition, even among the democracy? One thing to let you know: Lee, Lee Kuan Yew hated democracies. He also hated communism, except at his time. Everybody was a communist, but he uh, got them, he got their act together. Said, we are not going to be communists. And we're not going to. He didn't like democracies for one thing. He observed that in democracies, you get two parties. Nothing gets done. That's not true. Who said that's true? How can that, how can that be that true? But uh, so therefore, he uh, made sure that there was one party. That party was very clean, straight, and uh, they did not tolerate. Opposition parties. There are opposition parties in Singapore, but not like in China. In China, they do not, do not tolerate any opposition parties. But Singapore, if you're small and non threatening, they allow you to exist. In fact, in 2011, for the first time in history of all mankind, because the opposition party complained that the elected officials were making too much money, they voluntarily took a 15% pay cut. You ever heard of that? Government officials taking a pay cut? No pressure on them. They were making a lot of money, of course, but uh, they took a 15% pay cut. First time in history it's ever, it's ever happened. But I also have mentioned that Lee understood that the reason you have bad government is you have corruption. To stop corruption, he made, made positive incentive. He paid their government officials really well. The president of uh, Singapore now makes about $2.1 million. Government officials make about half a million. You're paid well, you better perform. It's merit, based on merit. You can keep your job, you're doing your job, if you're not, you're out. You're, <coughs> broke, you're out immediately. There's, the, with the positive incentive is that there's so much, you're rewarded so well, there's no incentive for you to be a crook. Because if you are a crook, you lose everything. You lose your housing, you lose your salary, and you lose face, and you get caned. So that's, that's a good reason why you don't want to be a crook. He 
uh, first thing that the first day they took over the country in 1965, they really negotiated relations, got fresh water. To this day, they're using Malaysian water. Although they've got these shallow Malaysian plants, and they've even set, set up some dams. But still, the little island of Singapore has very little internal resources. They import a lot of food, then they built schools to educate everybody. He recognized that education was important, so that was a big priority. That's why the women were all teachers, and everybody had to go to school. You had no choice. Not very democratic, but very effective. I mentioned to you that oh, when he was in uh, England, he realized that any country that's going to be great is going to have to have manufacturing. So the first thing he did was set up manufacturing textiles so people would have jobs. And of course, government started Singapore Airlines. Ever heard of Singapore Airlines? That's an airplane we all want to fly, but we can't afford it. It's a government-owned flight, very expensive, but they are excellent service. They are still the example for the rest of the world. And what happened was in 1971, the Brits finally left, left, all, left all their colonial roots and left Singapore. Unexpectedly, Lee Kuan Yew had a problem. He had an island, very strategic position. Everybody would like to have it because of the Malacca Straits. All ships have to ship to ship all the oil here that goes through there from the eastern hemisphere, western hemisphere. So it was a very strategic position. He knew that if he was, did not have a good military, people would be very lustful. A little island that would be easy for any major country to, to absorb it, to take over it. Malaysia is right next door, 10 times bigger than the dot, actually more than that. And so what he did was, no military, what am I going to do? People here are multi-ethnic, none of the military. What's, what am I going to do? What would you do? 1965. Not, not, not. Israeli embassy. We need the weapons. We need to train our people. So that's when he went to the Israeli, Israeli embassy, bought tanks and airplanes. He got training in Israel. So the guys got a good start. After that, he said, well, we've got some basic starts. Let's, what else do we have to do? Let's make sure we have strong allies. So he went to Australia, made friends with Australians. He went to Taiwan, made friends with Taiwanese. He went to France. But the big one is he makes friends with the United States of America. Today, Singaporean military is the number one ally of us. Nobody talks about it because they're just a dot. The Singaporean military is the strongest military in all of Southeast Asia. You can't compare it to China and Southeast Asia. They're very small. The military is extremely well trained. Their Navy trains in San Diego. They have some of the best ships in the world. They have 60 F-16s and 40 F-15s. If you're Air Force, you know those are the best airplanes in the world. F-15s, for example, have never lost them. No F-15 has ever lost a battle against the Russians or anybody else. So they have, the, they have actually have the newest ones. Because we're such strong allies, we would sell them the best f Their F-15s are more advanced than our F-15s. And it's very, anyway, it's got, the other thing is, that to show you how close they are, the things do a lot of training in Australia, but their main training is here in America. Their Navy trains in San Diego, their Army stays, trains in Texas. After Hurricane Harvey, within 48 hours, their squadron of helicopters was doing rescue. Before, our National Guard was just packing the bags. They were ready to go. Their Air Force trains with us in Dallas Air Force Base and on Mount Home. They train Red Flag. Red flag is the most sophisticated operation the Air Force runs. And during the Vietnam War, our F-4s and F-5s, our, our F-100s and F-101s flew against old Russian MiGs. And instead of winning all those battles, we, we, we split 50-50. First time in history that our Air Force did not have 10 to 1, 8 to 1 ratio. And the reason that was that is the Russian MiGs were more maneuverable, slower. And so if you're slower, you turn inside the faster airplanes, once you have tone, they're dead. Nobody can fly an air-to-air -air missile. So we, we learned that. So what we do is in 1982, we set up a red flag in Dallas, up in Dallas Air Force Base, home Air Force Base. And there, we have stolen, purchased, and borrowed Soviet MiGs and, and issues. And we train our airplanes against them with special pilots. So today, the United States Air Force pilots and the Singaporean pilots are the most experienced pilots in the world. Not only the best airplane, the pilots are trained to fly against enemy airplanes. It's really important because 
And the other thing <coughs> we also recognize for Air, Air Force pilots, they usually get shot down the first 10 combat missions. So the, the red flag, we give them the experience with 10 fly, 10, the first 10 missions so that they won't get shot down right away. And then they fly against Russian and other foreign airplanes. So they have a great advantage over the enemy. Nobody has U.S. Air Force planes to train against us. Nobody. So our Air Force pilots are the best in the world because they're trained. It wasn't always that way, but we were doing that. Anyway. And only the Sings are there. Once in a while, we we'll train some Brits, Australians, uh, Israelis. But in terms of Asia, Sings, Singapore Air Force, which has the largest Air Force in all of them, except for China. Their Air Force is larger than Australian Air Force. And they also train, they have a bit of a squadron of F-16 in Australia. Hey, Roger. Yes. How can they afford this military technology, manpower? Uh, what percentage of their Two percent. budget? Two percent of the budget goes to defense. That's all? The things are rich. They have over $500 million in cash success. The things are so successful. They do. They have manufacturing. They have friends. They trade with. They talk to Chinese. Make sure you trade with everybody. That you don't have enemies. They only have five million members. True. The military are responsible, but they uh, they're well trained and they're very motivated and they're smart people. I went to sell submarines to them, and they knew more about submarines than I did. And I was a sales guy. Okay, now after a couple of years of very success, China finally recognized that those guys are pretty important. Now, I'm going to put things in context. After Mao Zedong died in 1978, China was in really bad shape. The schools were decimated, there were no teachers around. The te teachers were persecuted because of, if they learned, if they learned if they had an English book, they weren't considered red enough. And so the literacy level of China in 1978 was 1%. Nobody will tell you this. I dug it out and figured it out. If you have 1% literacy, how are you going to be a great country? No way. So, one thing, well, I'm jumping ahead of me. We'll get back to that story in a second. So, 1978, 1%. Very, very, no industry. Nobody in China in 1978 had any idea how to build a nation. How could they? Deng Xiaoping was brilliant because he was a political commissar. He never built a nation, he built a city, he never driven a car. So he was, in many ways, a dummy, but he was a practical man and he knew how to use his head. He had to make China great again. But how do you do it? 900 million people, they're all farmers. People were illiterate. How do you do that? How would you do that? So, putting th things in context again. Early in the end, China took notice. And as Deng Xiaoping was making China great again, he described his journey as crossing a river one stone at a time. Making sure that stone was steady, it was, and you reach over and grab another one. But the third stone he grabbed was the pearl called Singapore. That made all the difference in the world. Now, CIA took this picture on the right. You don't see Duck Shopping in the swimsuits very often. There he is meeting with me on you for the first time. I really don't know where that picture came from. All these communists in the culture and skin and everything. Nobody would tell me where they got the picture. Now, Dumb visit, did some traveling because he had a lot of learning to do. So there's only one country he visited four times, Singapore. In 78, the first time he went there, he saw that people were well educated and that already there were one of the four tigers in, le in just over 20 years. 65, 70, 23 years. They were the four tigers. How would you do that in a country with nothing? Uneducated people, ethnic differences, only Lee Guan Yu. He is the one in a million dictator you want to have. 
We don't want to put down, we don't want to advocate dictatorships because 999,000 dictators are bad and incompetent. The thing about Lee Guan Yu was he was dictator, but he was competent, he was incorrupt, and he was benevolent. If you can get one of those kings, it's already happened, except that he's only, there's only one in history. That's what Lee Guan Yu is. Deng was amazed at economic success, so he said, here's a motto for, for China. The thing that uh, Lee told them was that you, we have a single party here, you and China, you Communist Party, you've got to stick, stick get, keep control of the thing, otherwise get, things get out of hand. China, through 4,000 years of history, has nothing but warlords. If you don't have a single party in control, you're going to be back to the warlords again, and you're going to be down in the pits again. He warned them that, and they listened. Bring honor to Confucian values and education. Like I said, when Deng went there in 78, at that time, Chinese literacy, literacy was 1%. By 1992, it was 90%. Do you, do you think that might have had, had an impact on the success of China? 1% to 90% literacy. We learned that visiting Singapore. You don't read this in history books. They liked him because he was the only nation in the world run by Chinese leaders. Li Guan Yu was Chinese, maybe four generations in Singapore. And after that, he ordered, actually, the, the number is closer to 40,000 now. Chinese officials and researchers and students today go to Singapore to imitate the model. Think about it. Who else can do that? And they not only got flies, they got tigers. The big tiger we got was Zhou Yong Kang. Zhou Yong Kang was sitting in a standard polo bureau, public, the highest rank, the, the top nine guys. He, Zhou Yong Kang, was the power of Google and the FBI, CIA together, plus domestic security. He was. He knew all where all the skeletons were, but because he had some political ambition. And he has had him until some place. He was caught, and he they brought him down. Nobody believed that when a man is powerful. And the, the Politburo, standing committee Politburo, at that time was nine most powerful people in, in China, all with PhDs. But this Zhou Yong Kang had too much ambition, and so in the dangerous <coughs> man because he knew all the skeletons were when you had an FBI, CIA, and internal security. By the way. China is one of the few countries in the world where they spend more money every year on domestic security than foreign than defense. So that's how you control, have control. We don't like that. That's, that's the way they have to run the country. 
control society, strict laws, severe punishments, control the media. If you allow your internet to go crazy with social media, you're going to get things out of control. So in, in Singapore, they've been doing that. That's what they're doing, that's what they're doing in China now. They learned that from League on You. You may really not like it. That's where, he, that's where these guys learned all these things. Build quality housing. Build a strong military. Make great military alliances. Like I said, Singapore has an alliance with the United States, Australia, France, Taiwan. The Taiwan one is it's very touchy, but uh, Chinese realize that it's not a threat to them. So they still tolerate the fact that about 10,000 Singaporean military go to Taiwan every year for military exercises. And some of them are stationed there permanently. I met them. English is a very important language. He, he told the Chinese to do that. The Chinese said, no, that's one thing the Chinese did not do. They did not want to learn English as a national tongue. And that's probably a good reason. But today, more Chinese speak English than we Americans speak English. Not too many of us speak Chinese, though. <laughs> OK, I've been talking about Lee Guan Yu like he's somebody I think is a great man. What do other people say about him? Henry Kissinger. I've had the privilege of meeting many world leaders the past century, none, however, that taught me more than Lee Yu. Singapore's first premier and guy in life. He and uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski considered him tops. George Bush called him in a long life in public history. I've never encountered many bright people, none more impressive than Lee Yu. So is this just Americans are saying that? Xi Jinping, Current president, he is our senior who has our respect. We will never forget the important contribution made to our bilateral relationship. Prime Minister of England, he is the smartest lady I've ever met. And so these are all people that invited them to, to make a state visit. New England, Jacques, French, Jacques Chen, Barack, English. Hatcher, put so in Indonesia, FW declared South Africa. South Africans and, and the Singaporeans do a lot of business together. The other Bush, Sultan Brunei, the other Bush, and remember our Secretary of State? He, this was when he was the head of Exxon. So not only is he uh, honored and recognized as very outstanding by political leaders, he's also a Some other people, you know, Vladimir Putin gave him a special honor award for valor. The interesting thing is because Lee was so effective as a dictator, all the dictators in the world promised their people, if you elect follow me, we'll be like Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a lot of them have stayed in, in power that way. One of these days we'll be like Singapore. Just keep me in power. We joke about it. Here's a list of people who all praise me, not only the political leaders, but all these captains in the industry. Murdoch, News Corp, John Chambers, Cisco, Palisano, IBM, Phillips of Exxon, Zealot, the World Bank, Wolfenson, the World Bank. So he's, he's got a pretty good list of people to support him. Here's a couple of shots of him. He was the man of the, he was the cover of Time Magazine twice. And that's the person he owes a lot to. That's his wife. She died in 2010. And uh, he uh, said a lot of great things about him. And her guidance had a lot to do with success with Singapore because he utilized the brains of all the brains of all the women. Today, we're going to change, the, we're not talking about China again, we're going to talk about today, a little bit more about Singapore, because that, that's a really important story that very few of us know. For global commerce, finance, and sea and air lowest corruption, lowest crime, there are 40,000 foreign co companies that 
have offices in Singapore. The Sings are very pro-business, like I, I don't know I mentioned before. Tax rate, 17%. When most foreign countries go to a country to get established, it's a big headache. You have to deal with bureaucracy, you hire translators, people to do your paperwork, it takes years sometimes to get the work done. The Sings, if you're a viable company, they will take you by the hand. We'll show you the paperwork. Give us your name, rank, sir, and over. We'll type it on there. All the paperwork's done for you. 17% rate of, uh, and then you want an office? Who will find an office for you? How much you want to spend? All kinds of benefits to make sure that foreign companies are successful. Successful, because they pay taxes. That's why Singapore's so rich. They know how to do business, and they know how to do business with the rest of the world. Something that very few countries have learned. Consider the best high-tech nation in, in, in Asia. Only 2% spent on the military. But spent very, very effectively. All their airplanes are underground. Or in Australia, somewhere in the United States. China and Singapore are starting, even though they have very close relationships, starting to have friction because of the issues of uh, territory in the South China Seas, etc. But even though the uh, Sings took the side of uh, the, uh, the Philippines or the uh, Solomon Shore or whatever that is, but the Chinese have uh, not made that a big issue. They've sort of forgiven the Chinese even though they didn't go, the Chinese didn't like the, uh, the Filipino decision. The, the International Court of Justice. Something I, I mentioned before, US-China, US and Singapore relations are really tight. Even though he warns people not to become a democracy, he's also, also an anti-communist. The things are very, very close to us. The 10 years I was overseas in Southeast Asia, every American diplomat met with Lee, Lee Kuan Yew. Lee recognized the importance of having a relationship with the Chinese military, with American military, and today, as I mentioned before, that relationship is like no other relationship. We're even closer than with Israelis. What they've done for us, because you know we've been developing Middle East for a long time, Singapore is almost a mandatory stop for anybody flying in and out of that part of the world. They replenish our ships, fresh food, hot towels, all that stuff. Not only that, they have special berths that handle maintaining our aircraft carriers. We don't even do that in San Francisco or Los Angeles. They're so positive. They also have brand new berths for our new Navy. Navy ships, the newest Navy ships are making. So uh, everybody in the U.S. military calls this, the things awesome because they support us so well. Again, for after Hurricane Harvey, within two days, the things sent their four rescue helicopters picking up Texans who had a hard time understanding Singlish. <laughs> but that was not a problem. They, they, they were there first before. Our National Guards were just packing their bags when they're rescuing people, because they were there out of active duty. These are people training their helo rescue operations and training in Texas. So they were in the right place at the right time. So they were there immediately. Nobody else was, even our own military, just getting ready because you have to get organized. It's called bureaucracy. I think uh, when uh, Li Shen Lung, the, the son of Li Guan Yu, visited uh, the mansion in Florida, where the, President lives? Mar-a-Lago. Mar he brought in an unrequested $14 billion check to buy Boeing aircraft. $14 billion check. They wanted 30 or 40 Boeing, the latest Boeing 700s or whatever it is. Can you imagine that? Without solicitation, somebody comes in with a government check <laughs> for $14 billion to buy. We're, that kind of relationship is very, very unusual. Okay, this is fun.
fun part now. Let's take a little tour of uh, modern Singapore. It's considered one of the most modern cities in the world. If you have time on YouTube, type in, you go to YouTube and type in Smart Cities Singapore. You'll be blown away. 15 minute video that tells you much more than I told you, plus show you pictures. Let's see some pretty pictures here before we shut down here. Scroll up over. This is modern Singapore. Actually, this, this thing's almost 10 years old. It's much more modern than this now. There's two shots of that view and day view. You see that strange building on the left there? Three. That's called the Marina Bay Sands. Eight billion dollars to build that. Twenty-five hundred and sixty-one rooms. Average room is six hundred dollars a night. You know how much money that is a day, a month, a year, in income? It's usually filled up. It's that I, I saw a sale today. Four hundred eighty dollars. Probably a basement. They got the biggest casino in the world there. It's in, it's in, it's embedded into the. Uh, it's so nicely fitted in there. You don't realize it's a casino almost. They have. The big, the big, they have a swimming pool that goes over the edge. You don't need a lot to get <laughs> close to the edge. It's magnificent. It's uh, 10,000 employees. And uh, good reason to own Las Vegas stay in stock. It's very stable and very profitable. You ought to visit it. Fly to Singapore Airlines if you can. You won't be sorry. What about, I mentioned about public housing. Singapore's public housing is number one in the world behind Vienna. Their public housing is like Marriott hotels. You mentioned 2,100 square feet. Same for everybody. But if you're rich, you have fancy doorknobs, gold bathtubs. But everybody's treated very fairly. They're actually over a million units now. This is a statistic. These are the public, public housing. They're all designed to be angled in such a way that every unit gets sentence. The roofs are all, you don't see here, the roofs are all covered gardens because it's so hot in Singapore. The only reason I don't live there is the average 110 degrees year round. That's the only thing bad about Singapore. Good news to show the brilliance of Lee Guan Yu. In that part of the world, he is the only, <coughs> the only government that has mandated air conditioning. Everything is air conditioned there. Oh, you may not have air conditioning in your home if you don't want to, but every office building, every school, every hotel, they're all air conditioned. It's only happening you're jumping in and out of your car. But he did that because in a tropical area, if your air conditioning productivity goes up. Otherwise, people are sitting down and sweating and taking a nap, taking siestas. People work very hard in Singapore, no siestas, but the conditions are such that you can work hard. Everything's air conditioned. And robotics, this is something new that I just learned last night. Singapore is the most advanced robotics nation in the world. I, I've been writing on the robotics, just to give you quick extra bonus information. Number one ro uh, robot country in the world is <coughs> Japan. Because 20 years ago, the Japanese realized that with the aging population, there would not be enough caregivers. So 20 years ago, they started making robots to take care of people for medical reasons. And today, the, 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 the Japanese have the, most, the largest variety, the most effective robots in the world. In 2006, when they built the first robot called Pepper, for helping women shop, etc., 1,000 units were sold in one minute. Sixteen hundred dollars. This is 2006. Now the very more fabulous. They have them, that dance and all that stuff. But the, they really are very valuable in taking care of people. The Sings took a shortcut. Instead of making a lot of robots, they made they made automated houses. So it's very complicated to make robots that don't walk into you and do all kinds of things. But they've got sensors so that if you fall down, the the the, what's the mems. The microscopic electronic sensors that are on the, rug, on the floor rug, if you fall down, that impact we sent to a central computer, and they'll know you fell down. They'll call you before they come on. That really isn't complicated. Not as complicated as making a robot that can 
take you out of bed, carefully look her to you, give you a bath, change your diaper. Those things are being done by uh, the Japanese. It's the second, uh, I also like to have a story about in Hong Kong, which is part of China, 10 years ago, a Chinese, a guy named David Hansen from Walt Disney decided to go to China to develop robots. And today, the most sophisticated robot in the world is called Sophia. Sophia, go on YouTube, type in Sophia, humanoid. Sophia, born, the first one was born in April of 2015, that's only three years ago. At first, all she could do was respond to pre-recorded questions. Today, Sophia is so sophisticated, you can ask her information on, how, on nuclear, uh, nuclear power, she can respond to it. Because of the cloud. Sophia, when you have high speed, in particular when you get the 5G, when you get the 5G, robots can be so powerful. Now Sophia can answer almost any question you give her about almost any subject. And if the, as long as the connection is good, she can respond to you in a couple of seconds. Sophia, made in Hong Kong by a, uh, and it's considered a Chinese company now. Sophia is so sophisticated. Hanson Robotics in Hong Kong. And uh, it's so amazing that the United Nations gave it the award for the most modern development a year ago. Last year, Sophia came to California and was given meditation lessons. Robots for teachers are going to be better than teachers because you can't be smarter than a robot. And the thing is, you have controlled lessons so that every class will be given very uniformly so that students will be given the same amount of information for the test. That's, that's pretty cool when you think about it, because you can, let's face it, if you have human teachers, no two teachers teach the same thing. If you teach the same course the next year, it's going to be a different course. But you've got standardized information the person needs, put in a robot, and you will get exactly what the person needs to know in controlled doses. And all questions will be recorded. You won't even need to take tests. Record the students' answers when you ask them questions. And you don't need to give them tests. Robots. They're not, most people don't realize, robots are here. You go down Second Street Market, there's a robot coffee shop called Ro Rotex. You walk in there, type in your order. It takes two or three seconds to make a coffee, but it takes time to process everything. But it's on Second Street, it's also mentioned in Robex, and the thing is, robots make better coffee than human beings. Because <laughs> it's precise. It's precise. Two cups of coffee, it tastes exactly the same because they pretty much put the same amount of coffee in. Now, you can just, the only thing is Chinese cooks to our robots, so it <laughs> tastes the same all the time. That's the problem. The cook. <laughs> robots with perfect section and fragmentation and control of amounts of things will have be the perfect cooks. Once you know, if you know how to cook a dish perfectly, teach a robot, then you'll be able to eat the same thing every night. Okay, let's take a look. Let's just we get back to take a look at a few more before we sign out here. These are all public housing in Singapore.
good salaries, everybody's got plenty of food to eat. The food in Singapore is the best in the world. Yeah. So people are satisfied, very satisfied, but we don't have freedom of expression. There are a lot of things you can't do. You just can't say bad things about the government. You're in big trouble. I say a lot of nice things about Lee Kuan Yew, but he was very, very cruel in his political oppositions. There are rumors he killed some of them, others were jailed. But he did everything for the good of the country, so he served for giving. But the people there, most people tell you it's a very vanilla place to live. If you live there for a while, it depends on what you're used to. You get raised there, you don't know anything else, you think it's great. Although you don't hear much about happiness. People are just satisfied because they get lots of food, they get great housing. Those that travel overseas to study, come to America, they sort of start to wish to more democracy in Singapore. But then they live in big, big cities where the crime is rampant and they're unsafe. They're, they flock back to Singapore for the safety because there's no, people lose cell phones and people will chase you down and give the police will chase you down to get your cell phone back. Okay, just before we sign up, we see you look into the future. Right? Like, <coughs> oh, yeah, this, <coughs> these are homes that uh, for the rich. <laughs> now, before we sign up, we're going to see public future housing. Future public housing. This one's done already. This picture is two, three, four years old. With that being that on a positive note, I hope that do you have any questions at all? I've been studying Singapore for 20 years, that's what I tell you about it. Nobody else can tell you as much as I did because I've been studying for 20 years. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Anything like population control like there was <laughs> Yes, they're encouraging more more children. If you get, if you, every child you get a thousand dollars at one time, because everybody's getting old in Singapore, <laughs> just like in every other place. So uh, because people are so busy, most people only have one or two, one, one or very few children. So in order to keep the population robust, they pro they provide you bonuses to get children. How does uh, Singapore address? Uh, the growing elderly population. Do they Robots. Have social security? They have medical. They have universal medical care, but it's not free. Everybody pays. If you're rich, you pay more. If you're poor, you pay less. But the country takes care of you. That's sort of nice. In America, people go broke when they get sick. Yeah. Anybody who gets cancer, almost all of them get, get bankruptcy. But do elderly, you have care. do elderly get a pension? You have to have pensions. You pay you pay your pension. People take money out of their pension money to buy homes. It's encouraged. That's one of the reasons they have these public savings accounts. Mandatory. You're required to save money. And when you save, you get a pool of money and, when you, and you can take it out to buy a house if you need it. So it's forced discipline. You, we don't like it as Americans. But for a country, you want, you want to have order. You want to keep you don't, you, want, you don't want homeless. You have things, positive control. They do it in Singapore. And what about the leadership uh, now in, of Singapore in terms of when other world leaders, as they have done in the past, appeal to the mentor? Who is there now? His son. Yeah, his son. The average salary, I think, after you put in 20, uh, you do 20 years teaching in K through 12, your salary is $78,000. You with modest growth, you start off about 30, 35,000. You put in your time, you get your 5% every year. By the time you put in 20 years, you're making $78,000 as a teacher. And you get status, public housing. It's a nation that takes care of people. 
Yes. They encourage all that stuff. They encourage that. Oh well, you go, you you not you don't have your own garden because space is. Plenty, but, no, but they people will have plants because because the psychology is that they want this island to be a paradise. You see pictures of it. They they treat like I said the roofs all have covered gardens to reduce temperature by 10 to 20 degrees. Is for pragmatic reasons. This is this is the equator. It's 110 degrees at average. They do everything they can to keep things cool, and so almost every high rise will have will have gardens on the roof. What about environmental issues like the recycling? They're very conscious of recycling. They have to be. This is an island. If you don't take care of garbage, you you, you be covered with garbage with five million people in two months. You'll be covered with garbage. And healthy there are smokers there, but it's, it's consistent. Because they're very health conscious, they're not encouraged. You don't go to jail for smoking. You don't go to jail for chewing gum either. You get fined. Not a big fine, but then you have to do a month of community service. <laughs> That's a very good deterrent. That's the reason it's clean. You've got a lot of people picking up garbage. The gum chewers. Halfway kidding. How's their public transportation? Beautiful. Everything works. The people they hire to run the infrastructure competent, or you're out of work. They're they well paid. Like everything else, there's a reason things are well. You, you make sure that the people who are hired are competent, and you pay them well. If they're not good, you get, get rid of them. Did I tell you about homeless? Homeless. There's almost nobody homeless in Singapore. What they do, if you're a homeless person, they'll take, they'll pick you up, take you to the doctor, make sure you're healthy, you don't have any communicable diseases. Then they give you six months of training. They test you first for your aptitude. If you, all you can do is cook, they'll send you to cooking school. During the time that you're training for six months, you get two thirds of your salary as if you were working. And then you have a mandatory savings account, checking out. So when you complete your six months of training, you're going to be, you're ready to roll. You got money in the bank, checking account, savings account. And if you, if you blow that, that's your problem. There's almost, there are a few bankers in, in Singapore, very, very few. But the government is positive incentive to keep. If you, you, you sweat, you, you, you survive. How is the innovation I'm not exactly sure. They, they, jo jobs, they, they, they're bringing in immigrants to fill jobs because there's so much work to do to maintain an island. And then the jobs finish and they go out, they leave? Every, everyone? Everyone? There are a lot of Chinese that go there. Okay. Very much of the population. Do they travel? Or what portion travels around here? Do they travel the world? The ones with money, they travel all over. Huh? The ones with money travel all over. They travel wherever they want. The Las Vegas, not anymore. Now that they have the Marina Sands, they don't need to go there because that, that's a fabulous resort. Any other questions? Yes? What percentage of the population emigrates to somewhere else and where do they go? I don't know. I don't know. Because they're not allowed to go anywhere else. Because they don't want to be considered as being part of the island. I don't know, but I know many of them that come to the United States at first love it until they run into the crime problem and they lust to see how peaceful it was back in Singapore. Where you don't have a, you walk the street at night, never worry about anybody robbing you. Do they go to certain cities in the U.S.? Anyway. They, they go, they come to San Francisco. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Roger, is there a drug problem that they have here with some nature at the end? No, they don't. Not for long. <laughs> they don't. That was a priority one. The Singaporeans remember what happened to the Chinese when the Brits came yeah. here. Oh, no. They didn't want none of that. Thank you. Well, wow, okay. Is the mandatory military service there? Is that a factor of success? And are there any other countries that might have been? I, it's mandatory public service. Right. If you want to join the military, that's fine. But the military is very motivated, very competent, in my opinion. Is that something other countries should adopt? 
You can't imitate. Just like, how can you imitate Singapore? You've got to change everything to, to imitate a country. You have to have, you have to have competent, benevolent leadership. And uh, in, and then corrupt. You get in government, corruption is everywhere. So they were able to solve that by making sure that people were given positive incentive. We're going to hire you based on merit. We're going to get your job. We're going to pay you well. If you screw that, tough. That's right. But also because it's only five million people, it's a heck of a lot easier to manage. Yeah, it's a city. It's a, it's a city. It's a city state. It's a city. It's, a city. it's the only one kind. Go on YouTube. Type in. Smart cities in Singapore. 15 minutes of the most interesting video you've ever seen. But it is, it is very interesting because the system is so fair. They treated everybody the same. They give everybody the same. It's not perfect, but it's almost fair. It's almost perfect. It's, it's not perfect, but it's almost perfect. Take it off. Yeah. Give everybody a chance. Like I said, the poor, if you're homeless, they'll give you a home for six months, right. give you training. After that, well, the government doesn't owe you anymore. If you blow it, it's your problem. And their education is free. Yes, public education is free. They have, they have private schools too, of course. Up to high school? Up to high school. Yeah. Then uh, going to college, they have a lot of scholarships. And I understand also they don't have, the city does not have anything like that. The district is all for rich. Or the oh, they deliberately mix everybody up. They mix everybody up so that you don't have classes yeah, of people who gain control and set their own enclave and set up their own societies, etc. So they make sure the kids go to it makes them, yeah. Yeah, I, I know about the hospital, but I know that they, they, everybody gets medical care, but you got to pay. It's not free. Things that are free, you can grant and you abuse. So that works. Yes. Actually, I'm, I'm from LA. I'm LA Chinese. I'm pretty interested about the public health system in Singapore. And uh, in Hong Kong, they do have the same systems like that. but. Uh, the price of houses is uh, ridiculous in Hong Kong. Just like San Francisco, also ridiculous. Really yes, but uh, uh, my question is, um, for the Singapore, the public uh, houses is pretty good, but for the for the foreigners who are going to be a Singaporean during their process, they are waiting their permanent residence. How to? I don't know about that. Okay. It all depends on how much money you have. Money talks even in Singapore. But I'm sure that there are, they don't put them in the public housing units, per se. Yes, I know. So They stay in the Marriott. They stay in Sands, Marina Bay. Yes. <laughs> like you said, in, in, in Singapore, uh, more than 80% houses is public houses. Built by the government. Built by but they're the owned, in most cases, by Singaporeans who take money out of their, their, their mandatory saving them to own property. Because that's how you make money. Property values go up in Singapore, too. Yes, so for us, for like uh, I'm a foreigner, I'm going to... Um, and study or start a career in Singapore. So uh, most of the houses are owned by government or um, the life expense for, uh, for us, the foreigners. How can we solve that problem? I, can, I don't know that much about what they do with foreigners because everybody's different. Some, I mean, a lot of foreigners go there temporarily, make some money to go back home. If you plan to go there and immigrate there and live there, Things would be different. A lot depends on what you do. I, I was planning to go to Singapore for university before, but uh, um, as far as I know, um, to their to universities, be, um, their schools are the best in the world. Yes, to, to, they to partner gain, with Harvard and Yale. Yes, I know. To to gain the permanent uh, uh, residence, right? It, it takes about years, but during that years, you are complicated of your status in Singapore. I can understand why it is, because you're not you're not a fish or a fowl. Yes. They, 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 won't, they won't abuse you, but they won't treat you really well either. Yes. So that's a hard time for a foreigner. I'm sure it's, it's a hard time. But it's, a lot um, depends. You, you, you get sponsored by a company, it's a different matter. But if you go by yourself, you're on your own. You don't, you know, like I said, a, a company goes to Singapore, and they have a whole bureaucracy set up to help to make sure you're successful. Because they want you to be a taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to you have understand it's a small place. Yeah, but they have it's to control the immigration policies. Otherwise, all the homeless are going to move to Singapore. What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I mean, I they can't just open the border mm -hmm. for everybody. In Hong Kong, they do have the public houses in systems, but uh, it takes seven, eight years. For you have to wait about three years in, in Singapore for you know, three years. Because the demand is huge. But 80% of the population already has. Everybody waited. Mm -hmm. 
to get their location paid, to get their papers to buy a house. So you're curious to me. Also, they have control cars, small island that have absolute control. You have to pay a lot of money for a license. Yes, and the cars are double, triple. They, they want to make sure that they control the number of cars to make the road, road smooth. I've been to Singapore before. Yeah, very expensive, and you have to get in line for a license. That sort of freedom that we have here, they they, they can't possibly get Well, it's, you have to, otherwise it's going to be the crazy. Same. The reason they have controls is so otherwise you don't have chaos. Yeah, otherwise it would be chaotic. That's right. That's why they have to Yeah, in California, you've got 1,500 new cars that come into the state every day. And the roads aren't getting wider. Yes. So you can't drive anywhere for less than an hour. Yes. So now you say, Thank check you. the now's model after Well, they copy the, 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 the principle. Oh, one thing is that. Sing, Lee Guan Yu traveled to China many times to set up the Suzhou Industrial Park and to personally mentor each of the presidents as well as business people throughout China. Lee Kuan also wrote a book in 2011, wasn't it? He died about three years ago, called One Man's View of the World. And it's a very interesting book to read. He commented about almost every country in the world. He was a very good view. People got, even though you disagree with him, it's hard to get mad at him because he's not doing it for self-interest. So, Roger, what about security? Is there cameras everywhere? <laughs> they were the first. The Singaporeans are way ahead of us. They are way ahead of us. They got robots. They got, they got, they got, they got homes are now electronic to take care of all the elderly people. They thought about that. Long before anybody else did. I've heard that there's urine detectors yes. in, 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 in the You sit in the ground to catch your DNA and they only put you in an hour. Yes, we Roger. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody I know is on vacation or gone someplace. Yeah, who else would they The thing is, when, when Dunn took over, how do you go to school? Yeah. Yeah. The rules it gave them. Control the internet. Bad or good, depends on who you elect. <laughs> you get the best democracy in the world. If you don't elect the right person, you can have problems. So it's the leaders more than the political system. Because you have a dictatorship with a perfect leader, that's the ideal government. So so the chances of getting an ideal leader is zero. <laughs> oh, one more thing. <laughs> I give this in a separate lecture, but I'd like to tell you that I learned about our. Uh, organization within the Communist Chinese Communist Party called the Organization Department. Mm -hmm. They've been around for many, many years. This is the China's HR Department. They have a beautiful building in Shanghai, unmarked. And what they do is, the first day you become a Communist Party member, they open a file on you. They do this to make sure that no rice farmer ever gets elected president. No rice farmer? Can become a, you have to, you have to have a long, history oh, of government official. Yes. The Xi Jinping is filed four drawers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because not only do they keep the performance reports of your bosses, they take once you get up to a, a management level, a city, a village, they take polls on you. Yes. Your your boss may say you're great, but they'll check it out. They'll take polls among the workers in the company and say, is Joe a good worker? What do you think about it? These files get huge. By the time you are a 30-year Communist Party running for central government leadership, they got four drawers of information on you. You can't fool anybody. The organization department. Very other interesting. Words, in other words, you can never move up to be a leader of that country unless you work your way up from the bottom. Not necessarily from the bottom, but you've got to have 30 years of experience. Yeah. Sometimes if you're a son of a, you can get, you can jump into you don't, have to be, you don't have to be a street block yeah. chief. You can be in a village or a town. In other words, you cannot be just somebody who's a businessman. Well, the Chinese have been around for 4,000 years. They, they, made, they made those mistakes already. So they're not trying to make those mistakes again. Right, exactly. What about 
still a problem. Also, we have that problem here too, I understand. <laughs> and, and are there anybody that they specifically keep from integrating or keep from visiting? Keep from visiting? Besides Trump? <laughs> I, I didn't say that. Did I say that? <laughs> you didn't hear me say that. I deny it. Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> no, actually, he was there, right? He was there recently in Singapore with Um. He didn't get to stay at the Sands, though. He wouldn't let him stay. <laughs> he did some, needed something more secure. The Sands with 2,651 rooms, not secure enough for an important guy like Donald Trump. Great questions. Kept me on my toes. Roger, what's what's not too good?